Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, mute. Hi. Hello, um, welcome to uh, MLVIS. This is Daniel Archambault, um, and I'm one of the co-chairs. As probably noted here, um, this year Euroviz is a, a virtual conference. And so um, I will be uh, welcoming you to our YouTube live channel. Um, and uh, hopefully our exciting program consisting of three tutorials and some paper presentations. So, if you don't know, MLVIS is now in its fifth year, and the uh, main topics that we really uh, discuss here are um, how visualization and methods can benefit from machine learning, how machine learning be uh, methods can benefit from visualization, and how our communities can uh, work uh, better together. As just mentioned, this is our fifth year. The idea originally began in a Dagstuhl seminar back in uh, 2015, and we thank uh, Dagstuhl for offering such a great environment uh, to foster these sorts of ideas. So our workshop uh, structure is as follows. Uh, our workshop has both a tutorial and a paper presentation component. Uh, we will have three tutorial presentations from the workshop organizers. The first will uh, be from Ian, the second one from Yako, and the third from myself. This year at MLVIS, we accepted five short papers, and we will have uh, those presentations uh, in the first and second session. And then uh, we have a uh, panel at the end of MLVIS where all of the pr presenters will be available uh, to answer your questions. So uh, in the paper submissions, MLVIS for the third year in a row um, has accepted short paper submissions. We had a record number of submissions with nine, uh, of which we accepted five. We have a small PC um, listed below, and we really thank all of these PC members for their uh, participation in, um, uh, in uh, this workshop. So new to this year, as mentioned at the beginning, this is a virtual conference. You probably are already tuned in to YouTube Live. Now, how can you connect and uh, participate in the workshop? Because workshops generally are interactive. Well, uh, in order to participate uh, with a workshop, um, you uh, can essentially uh, engage with us either directly on the YouTube Live comments during a uh, presentation or panel, or you can join our Discord uh, server. Uh, if you don't know where those are, we've put up the links on the MLVIS website, um, which is uh, exactly right here. And uh, with this short opening, I'm now going to hand over to Ian for the first segment of our tutorial. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, Yaka seems to find that our YouTube live stream is not showing slides at the moment. Um, so I'm not quite sure what we can do about that. Um, Daniel, do you want to take off sharing of your screen and I'll share my screen and we'll proceed, I think. It's probably the best way to go. Uh, right, I'm going to share my screen because I'm going to be moving back and forth between PowerPoint and uh, a web browser as well. So uh, the first uh, talk is is sort of uh, sort of a quasi tutorial. It's not a classical tutorial in the sense of providing information about uh, techniques. That's very much more what the other two tutorials are about. Uh, and in particular, um, some of the things I'm going to talk about around text analysis will be covered in in more detail in Yako's talk. 
So, but I just thought when I was thinking about what I was going to talk about today, that there is one topic of conversation that does seem to be dominating the airwaves at the moment. And uh, I thought I'd find out what people are doing in terms of data science and visualization in this area and trying to give you a flavor of what's happening. So to introducing, since December 2019, uh, by April the 25th, there were over 24,000 research papers uh, from peer-reviewed journals as well as sources like MedArchive available online. Uh, if we look at the, the graph here in the bottom right-hand corner of the, the plot, this shows the, uh, the growth in the number of papers. So the purple line here is the total number of peer-reviewed. Uh, the next one down is MedArchive, uh, Archive, and uh, blue is BioArchive. Um, the graphs might look familiar. They look a bit like an exponential growth, um, that sort of shape that we've got very used to over the past few months. So clearly, the amount of research that is going on in this area is uh, phenomenal. And it's also clear that data science, defined broadly, will play a central part in the global response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And there are a number of different ways it can be used. So uh, for risk assessment, for screening and diagnosis, simulation and modeling, which has caught a lot of attention, for contact tracing, which we're sort of all gradually moving on to now, understanding social interventions, which is a very hot topic, particularly in the UK, as those who perhaps follow the news uh, in the UK would know, but I'm sure also in other countries too. You only have to look at the protests in the United States to see that uh, Social interventions are often very strongly contested. It can be of use in logistical planning, in automated patient care, and in supporting vaccine and therapy development. Indeed, if one thinks back, one of the very first things that was done was sequencing the genome of, um, of the coronavirus concerned, and that sequencing involved, no doubt, a huge amount of data analytics as part of what was going on. So what are the challenges in this area? Well, there are quite a few, um, but three that I think really stand out. First of all, uh, for data availability. So if we're going to do uh, look at medical images or analyze the text of doctor's notes, the data sets are very small compared to the requirements of deep learning models. I know there are a lot of people who have had cases, but in terms of actually curated data, sample sizes range from uh, a few up to about 60 patients. That's clearly way short of uh, something that will enable you to do deep learning with. And this scarcity is often due to the distributed nature of many data sources. So for example, electronic healthcare records are often segregated on a, a national, regional, or even per hospital level. And the key challenge is therefore federating these sources and overcoming practical differences across each source. And I'll, if I have a chance, talk a bit later actually about the difficulties even uh, within national in, within, within national boundaries, but also more more uh, obviously across national boundaries for this. And another key challenge here is balancing urgency or exigency versus the need for well-evidenced and reproducible results to inform policy. The important point here, and I'll, I'll come back to this, is that a paper that's wrong uh, doesn't just damage your reputation as a scientist; it could be very damaging in terms of the health of your the country you live in. So it's important to capture and communicate uncertainty. There are far too many um, pieces of information out there which uh, sound more certain than the person writing them actually feels. Um, and just to pick up on that, so this about uncertainty, there's a nice graph here. Uh, David Spiegelhalter, who is one of the you know, leading medical statisticians in the UK, this um, was a, a graph he produced uh, in early April about the probability uh, proportion um, that involved COVID in deaths registered between, in a week between March 21st and 27th. And it's showing the difference in uh, death rates between men and women. So men are, are in brown and women are in green. But also you'll see um, quite fine there the, the error bar on that probability or percentage. Other challenges, security, privacy, and ethics. So, for example, the, the, the social acceptability of sharing data varies significantly by country. So there are huge debates in the UK and the US over tracking and, and what a tracking app, uh, how the tracking app should be implemented versus in South Korea, where basically the uh, government or government agencies have got hold of every possible piece of data, including your credit card transactions, all your mobile phone data, to make sure that the tracking is done in depth. And so there's a real, a really interesting or 
challenging question about how far do we move away from cultural norms in order to preserve them, because the fact is in lockdown, there are a lot of things that we can't do that we would normally do publicly. And another really important thing here, it's always true for, for data, data science, but particularly so here, the need for multidisciplinary collaboration. Uh, comments have been made about we've got far too many physicists who get hold of a, an SIR model, put in some parameters and then publish a blog about it uh, without taking any account of what's actually known and indeed working with experts in the field. So that's the, the, the challenge around data and around information visualization, uh, sorry, around, around machine learning. If we look at turn to information visualization, um, it's been said we're all epidemiologists now. People are looking, consuming data, uh, visual data in all sorts of forms. So here's a, a, a sort of graph that we've seen of a simple geographic uh, plot of the number of cases uh, given by the size of the red blob in different countries at a certain point in time across Europe. The flattening the curve graph that we've probably all seen uh, in many cases, I would argue actually that that graph leaves off the most important piece of information it should be we should be telling you, which is the consequence of going above, of the curve going above the healthcare system capacity, which is this line running across here, the consequence of that is more deaths. And it really doesn't show that at all, because the point about the reason we don't want to go above the capacity is that uh, if you do so, you have many more people dying uh, and also many more healthcare workers dying as well because they're, they're pushed too hard. And that graph doesn't actually convey that rather important piece of information. And then another thing down here, time trends of the number of reported deaths. That was taken um, in uh, late April at a time when the UK wasn't top of the list. Of course, it's gone shooting up since then. Uh, and we all got very expert in whether linear scales or log, linear sc log scales were, were more relevant. So there's a lot of information visualization out there in the, in the public in a way that perhaps hasn't been the case for for many other interesting or challenging challenges to society. Uh, and it's really up to us to make sure that that information is um, accurate and useful. So if we go away from the very simple plotting of, of single variables, um, some work, interesting work being done here on a, in a paper and the, the references are all in the, uh, in the back of the, of the presentation. Uh, a representation of representing multiple dimensions at the same time by using a data projection technique. The one used here is called ball mapper. Um, and I'll show you some of the graphs that were produced. So what it does is it produces um, circles for different regions and uh, similar ones are put in the same circle. The size of the circle is in a population and six socioeconomic factors were used in terms of looking at how we cover this data and then linking together on very fine lines. I perhaps should try and show this. It might be a bit clearer, but fine lines showing that where there are balls which uh, are covering the data where they intersect. And um, a couple of things to note here, for example, so the colouring is given by the number of uh, cases in that particular region, with purple being the most, and it go, the, the dates here are roughly weekly intervals. So at the start, number ball number 20, which is Hammersmith, Kensington and Chelsea, it's not connected to anything else because it has very, very high earnings per, 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 per inhabitant and therefore is not similar to any other part of the, uh, uh, of the UK. And it has a very, very high infection rate. And you'll see uh, proportionately, and you'll see as time goes by, that actually other parts of the UK have higher infection rates. But uh, if I was to be critical of this, and I guess that's my job here, I would say, actually, this hasn't done a very good job. Um, because if you look here at Ball 7, for example, that contains uh, Bristol, Birmingham, Nottingham, Manchester and Liverpool, all of which have had very, very different trajectories for the in incidence of COVID-19. So it's not clear to me that this graph is really helping us understand uh, regional diversity of uh, outcomes. Uh, people have used a, a lot of social media data. Um, there are some concerns about that. For example, only a small fraction of the data is geotagged, so we don't know where it comes from. 
And uh, also the number of bots that are running on Twitter is so huge these days. I'm not sure it really even gives you much of a feel for public sentiment. But anyway, this is what's been done in the US. So the left hand graph here is negative sentiment in tweets by state. And the right hand one is fear sentiment in tweets by state. Uh, with red being the, the, the most urgent uh, or highest concerns and yellow being the lowest. Uh, and you can see that the two are similar, but not um, not the same. But also, uh, actually, there's very little correlation between the sentiments in tweets and the, um, and the actual prevalence of COVID in that particular state. So, um, for example, uh, this state here, which I think is Wyoming, is a state with virtually no cases and very few deaths. And yet negative sentiment and fear seem to be quite high. Uh, they also followed this up with word clouds, which were not very informative and, and helpful. So people have applied uh, some more sophisticated techniques. So some deep sentiment analysis using uh, deep neural networks and a sophisticated approach using uh, various reddits to get the data, pre-processing, information retrieval, uh, and deep learning and sentiment analysis and a word cloud. And here's a word cloud of the most frequent topic. Uh, and if I was to be honest, I would say, I don't think you learn very much from that. The words that turn up lots of times are people, day, virus, bad, sick, and worse. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that really tells us anything very useful. Uh, perhaps a slightly more interesting uh, approach was the sentiment to lifting restrictions. This actually could have some public uh, policy relevance in the sense that um, understanding how people are feeling about the lockdown and how they're responding to it is actually really quite important. So this is an analysis done of um, between April the 12th and April 21st, just over 200,000 tweets scored and analyzed. And the um, there's a live dashboard, uh, which I will link to in a moment. So here the red line is people who are um, negative about lifting lockdown. The green line is those who are positive. And you can see the green line is generally above the red line. More people are sort of neutral. Um, having said that, given that there are no country-specific uh, tweets here, the information is, I would say, almost is of very little value because different countries are at different sp stages of their lockdowns and so on. There is a, a live dashboard, um, which I'll click on, and hopefully you'll be able to see. So this shows um, uh, real-time sentiments for Twitter, today's status and summary status from previous days. So I think the dashboard is of interest, but I think um, for it to be of, of particular value, one would need to have um, countrywide or countrywide or preferably region-wide uh, information. People have also started, given the number of papers, doing meta-research by doing text analysis of scientific papers. Um, I think I'm running out of time, so I will try and rush on here. Uh, one interesting technique was to use hierarchical topic visualization using latent dish reactor allocation. And that is something that Yako is going to cover in a later tutorial. And again, there's a, an online dashboard. The link is here, which enables you to dig down into different aspects of um, what research, where research is happening. So, for example, uh, researches around social intervention have grown very significantly over the last couple of weeks, as you would expect, because people are now looking at that phase much more than they were before. Um, so, for example, there, as, I, as I said here, there is um, uh, unprecedented social distancing, and you can look at the number of papers, and here it's shown that the, the peak has come up hugely uh, in, in this last week. Quite a few papers about responding to a new disease. There was a peak, and then that's going down again, interestingly. Um, perhaps that's because everything's going quiet while the trials are happening. And it's enabling people to find relevant work from across different topics. So um, there is some interesting work going on there if you want to find out more about research in COVID. So um, this is a quite an unusual survey. Uh, you might say a paper that was written one month ago is now a classical or an old paper. Um, certainly the data has, has gone. Um, the lack of definitive data, both nationally and internationally, is a real problem for modeling. Um, if you model by, if you're trying to model cases, then that depends largely on the testing strategy of each country, not really on the, on the number of actual cases in the country. Deaths might seem a bit simpler, but again, different countries work in different ways. In the UK, we've had um, 
hospital deaths were recorded and then they counted in care home deaths and then the Office of National Statistics a couple of weeks later then issues excess death numbers, which give you a much better understanding, but they're all tracked from different days. So really, to un instead of taking announcements of death, you should take date of death. So actually, the amount of pre-processing and analysis to even get a realistic data set of the number of deaths on any particular day is highly non-trivial. Epidemiological models, which you might want to combine your data analysis with, are not always publicly available. The main UK model uh, by Professor Ferguson is actually on GitHub. You can download it. But actually, there are now concerns about the software engineering because people have tried running it and can't reproduce results. And perhaps as part of the uh, consequence of this, there's a lot of analysis on social media data and scientific data papers. Now, there's a surprise. <laughs> it's very easy to get hold of very large amounts of data, um, perhaps rather less easy to, to analyze it in a relevant way. So what do I think we should take away? I think we should take away humility and responsibility. What we write or what we visualize needs to be um, needs to be uh, clear and accurate, and we must state the uncertainties. There's a lot more hanging on the conclusions than an academic reputation. So we need to collaborate. This, this, this nice XKCD uh, comic here, you know, psychologists say sociology is just applied psychology. Biologists say psychology is just applied biology. Biology is just applied chemistry, which is just applied physics. And then the mathematicians are way over on the right. We're going to have to work together. Our fields are not just applied versions of each other. There are genuine insights from different people. And also, I think um, this middle plot, this middle co comic is also of relevance here. One person asks, this is your machine learning system? Yep, you pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra, then collect the answers over the side. What if the answers are wrong? Well, you just stir the pile until they start looking right. We really cannot afford to be in that situation. We have to be working with principles. So there's a bibliography. And thank you very much for your time. Back to Daniel, I think. Daniel, do you want to unmute? Or maybe, yeah, okay. So, I am the next uh, presenter. So, hello everyone. I am Jakob Elbenen from Tampere University in Finland. The Zoom background you can see behind me is a scene from Tampere. So, before we go into my presentation, this is the last opportunity to ask a question for, for Ian. So if there is any question you would like to ask, then please type that either in the live stream chat or in the Discord chat. Currently, I'm not uh, seeing any questions for Ian. So, except that there is uh, this comment from Elier in the live stream that the point about including uncertainty in the visualizations is a great point. So I think we can all agree with that. So next, we will go to my part of the presentation. So I will share my screen and then hopefully you will be able to see my slides. In order to avoid repeat performance, I guess I'll wait just a little moment to see whether we can get the slides uh, showing up in the live stream as well. I think they're not there yet, but I'm looking at the live stream. So when the slides appear, then I will start talking about their contents. Basically, what I will talk about is methods for exploration of text data. I will talk about uh, topic modeling. I will talk about information retrieval, and I will also talk about the methods that have been associated with them in order to visualize the results of those methods. So I think we have the slides up now. Great. So we will get going. So indeed, exploration of text data. And basically, text data comes in uh, so many different forms. There's literature. 
there's the different kinds of news, there is web pages, uh, there are product descriptions of various kinds, product reviews, various kinds of questionnaires, um, text related to media, like scripts and closed captions of various entertainment and online videos, uh, question answers, uh, instructions, uh, knowledge bases, like encyclopedias and Wikipedia and, and other things like that. We have uh, science research articles, uh, laws, court records, patents, and these kinds of things. So there are so many different types of text data with different kinds of structure, that there is a lot of potential for visualization to help explore these kinds of data. But we are in the MLWIS workshop, so we are here talking both about the ML side and the VIS side. So before we go into the VIS side, I'd like to first talk a little bit about the modeling side. So to do that, let's talk about the concept of topic models. That's one of the prominent ways of representing underlying themes in collections of documents. Basically, topic models represent document content as bags of words or keywords or key phrases, anything that you can count from a document. And basically, they represent the way that a document has arisen as a process of two steps. Uh, one, where you choose what to talk about. This is basically choosing a topic and then choosing from that topic what to say, a particular word, a vocabulary term from that topic. And this is repeated many, many times over to generate the content of a document, whatever it is. And then these kinds of models depend on a number of parameters. So the contents of these topics in particular is one of these parameters. So when you fit the model to a set of collected data, this will learn the topics in the data. So this you don't have to pre-specify what kinds of topics there might be. It automatically learns them from the data. And many topic model methods have been proposed. One of the most well-known ones is Latin Dirichlet allocation. We'll talk about that uh, in a little while. And there are non-parametric versions such as hierarchical Dirichlet process topic models and their extensions such as these two extensions to deep hierarchies here at the bottom of the slide. So I'll mention these and because we are a little bit behind the schedule because of the technical difficulties, I'll try to kind of do it speedily. So please feel free to ask questions later as well. So Topic models basically have a graphical representation which can be shown like this. So every document has a mix of the topics. So one do document could be, for example, half about sports, half about, um, let's say, AI, if the document is, for example, about use of AI in sports. And then each of these topics has an underlying mix of the words. And then for each word, you repeatedly choose which of the topics the word should come from and then which of the vocabulary terms in that topic you would actually show. So this is the basic idea and one of the key implementations of this idea is Latin Dirichlet allocation. It's a method from 2003 by May et al. Very popular probabilistic model to find these underlying themes in text data collections. And it basically has the generative process that I showed in this previous slide with the, with the colorful balloons here. The same thing is shown as mathematics. So there is assumed to be a distribution of words for a finite number of topics. And then for each document, you first choose how many words there are going to be there that comes from distribution, such as a Poisson distribution. You choose the proportions of topics that there would be in this particular document that is coming from a Dirichlet distribution. And then each word is then generated according to a choice following those proportions of topics. And then the actual vocabulary term is chosen from a distribution uh, specific to that topic. Practically, this means that the probability that this kind of model gives to a collection of documents can be written 
with this kind of complicated equation. Basically, the mathematics breaks down into parts where there's one part for each document, which is an integral over the possible topic content it might have. And then for each word, there is also a sum over the possible topics that word might have. So this kind of model can be fitted to a set of data by optimizing the parameters that tell how the topics should vary across the documents. And there are different optimization approaches. Variation of Bayes is one way. Gibbs sampling is another example. So we won't go into those optimization details, but be aware that there are these different ways these kinds of models can be optimized. So when you've done that kind of optimization, at the end result, uh, you will have, for every document in your document collection, you will have proportions of how the topics were estimated to occur in that document. And then for each of the topics, you will have a word distribution. So on this slide, I have an example of what those word distributions might look like. So there could be one topic which turns out about turns out to be about visualization methods. So it contains words like visualization, algorithm, method, interface, plot, graph, and so on. Another topic might be about graph layout. So it might contain words like graph, edge, node, vertex, uh, crossing, bundle, and these kinds of things. So. This is the end result after running a latent Dirichlet allocation model. Now, there is a downside to models like these, where you have to assume that you know the number of topics. So instead, there are non-parametric variants where you don't have to assume that. Dirichlet processes are such a variant. And in a Dirichlet process, the amount of necessary topics is learned from the data itself. So skipping some of the details, the way the inference works is that the document is represented as a kind of like a restaurant where the words are customers. Now, to generate a document, you generate the words one by one. The next word looks at where the previous words are sitting at various tables, which correspond to different topics. So each of these words is sitting at one of the tables. That means that that word has been generated from that particular topic. And those topics, in turn, come from an overall variety of topics that could exist across all the documents. Now, in order to generate a new word into this document, you basically go by popularity. So the new word prefers to sit at tables where a lot of the previous words are already sitting. So the probability is to pick one of those tables or topics is directly proportional to how many words already came from there. But there is always a possibility to activate an entirely new topic, which allows the model to learn the number of topics. So this is how you generate words into an existing document. And other documents do the same. So they all have words sitting at tables serving different topics. And if a new topic is needed in one of these documents, then you go into this upper level a variety of topics or a kitchen, I guess you could call it. And from there, you pick topics according to how many tables across the different documents have already reserved uh, a topic from there. So you again count how many times this topic has been chosen by the different underlying documents. That's the way these uh, inferences work. Of course, in addition to that, you also count for each topic the different vocabulary terms that were generated. So you count how many times each individual term has been chosen in each individual topic. Now, basically, the inference just works like this. You add words to documents or you remove temporarily a word from its current table and you move it to a different table according to these probabilities. After that, the end result will be very similar as in Latin Dirichlet allocation. There are also deep hierarchical extensions. One of these is uh, from my research group from 2018, where we model multi-level conversation forums and there this kind of restaurants and kitchens analogies taken even further with multi-level restaurants where you point to delivery stations to get your topics and the delivery stations point further onward and so on. 
there are further extensions that in addition to these uh, topics uh, also model uh, the presence of authors who are writing these different documents so you can also model that which kinds of authors are likely to write about different topics in these hierarchical versions you also get lists of topic activities per document and per hierarchical uh, uh, document collection subset that you are modeling and you also get for e every topic again a list of the most prominent words so now that these topic models exist people have tried various solutions to visualize them because we are over time i have to kind of really breeze through them so here is an example topic browser from Gardner et al. 2010. It's basically just uh, individual windows where you can filter topics by, by different uh, criteria. And you can see the top documents in every topic. You can see the top words. You can see similar topics and some other things like that. Uh, Chanay and Blay had a similar visualization which they used for uh, Wikipedia. So again, topic prevalences, main words, prominent documents, and other similar topics. You could see that in the uh, different windows of this interface. Murdoch and Allen, uh, AAAI 2015, had a view where they showed for many documents at the same time, their topic content in this kind of stacked bar chart fashion. And Smith et al. had a version where they broke every topic down into subtopics by rerunning the topic modeling for subsets of the documents. And then you could have this sunburst chart visualization where you could delve down into the subtopics of every topic. There is also a visualization by Chuang et al, where they show by seriation the connection between topics and different terms in the vocabulary. There is from Smith et al, a layout for uh, topics in groups and uh, the term co-occurrences per topic. And then this is an interesting one from Iwata et al, where the model is actually generating the topics in a way that depends on spatial positioning in a visualization. So the probabilities of those topics in a document depend on positions in this visualization and positions of topic representation nodes as well. So this is an interesting one as well. For hierarchical document collections, we can also make interfaces that try to show how the hierarchy is reflected across different parts of the document collection. So this is a system from 2018 where there is multiple linked views. There is a dimension reduction based scatter plot of documents organized by similarity of content and it has been linked by color to the hierarchy of a multi-level conversation hierarchy. So this conversation forum had thousands of conversation sections they got colored and those colors are overlaid then on the content-based map so that users can then filter by the similarity of the content or filter by similarity of the section and they can zoom in and select content and so on now our um, the other thing that i wanted to cover is information retrieval and uh, basically uh, shortening this a lot, uh, the basic approach of information retrieval is to have a query where you, which is represented as a fraction of an ideal document. Um, a unigram language model models the document content and scores the document by how likely it is to produce that ideal fragment that corresponds to your query. There are more advanced models that, that improve on that, but that's the basics. And then several interfaces have been created for that. This is an interface where you can filter results by metadata attributes. This one uh, clusters the documents by a self-organizing map and shows them in a 3D interface corresponding to the self-organizing map grid. Uh, this is an interface showing an ent document entity graph. Uh, this one from uh, Arnan Brusilovsky arranges documents in a scatterplot by their similarity to 
query terms and terms that are coming from a user model. Those are arranged, for example, in a circle, and then documents are positioned to be close to the terms they feature the most. And then lastly, this interface here uh, is an interface where many, many hundreds of uh, keywords are organized in two ways. The radius is based on their relevance to the current ongoing query, and the angles are based on the responsiveness of those keywords to different kinds of feedback, relevance feedback that, that the user might give. So this is basically a radar representing the context of an ongoing search, and the user can then uh, drag one of these keywords in order to indicate interest in one of these terms. So this is suggesting to the user uh, an amount of terms that are coming from predictions of an underlying user model, as well as terms that the user has explicitly indicated. Because we are uh, out of time, I think I will uh, close here so that we can uh, move to the next presentation. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jaco. Um, I've been monitoring the Discord and the um, and the um, uh, the Discord and the uh, YouTube uh, chat. Please feel free on these presentations to uh, provide uh, questions and comments. Um, but since we're a little bit quiet there right now, I think I'll just continue with my uh, presentation. So. Okay, so um, this is a presentation more from the visualization end, and it's a little bit of a case as to why we need uh, visualization and uh, our machine learning or, or data analytics methods to work together. So it's not the case that we can blindly apply one without knowledge. Uh, for the other. I gave a similar talk at the Turing Institute um, earlier this year. So what's the role really of visualization in data science? Well, it's almost like what's the, uh, the reason we have windscreens for cars. So visualizations are kind of the windscreen for data science where machine learning's the engine. And these two things need to work together in order to have effective, um, uh, effective analytics. So when humans need, um, we, we require these windscreens when humans need to understand the AI system. If something goes wrong, we, we need some way to understand what's going on to, to fix it. And explainable AI also provides uh, a presentation uh, to the data to the human, whether it be in a explanatory, exploratory setting. So perhaps, just perhaps, the right visualization is a table of statistics. Maybe, maybe that is the case. Well, I I don't know how many of you uh, know about the data source. It's kind of a little bit like Anscombe's quartet. It was uh, published at CHI in 2017. So uh, the idea here, you have um, a set of statistics, uh, a mean uh, being 54.26 in X, uh, 47.83 in Y, standard deviations there, and a correlation of 0 0.06. And how many different features can you get? How many different uh, visual representations of this data can you get in the end? Well, it turns out a lot. You can get no trends, you can get clusters, you can get stars, you can get concentric rings. Uh, you can get uh, a whole variety of different uh, things. 
But you can also get a dinosaur. And I, I really suggest you just follow this link uh, to see uh, this example. Um, it's not only scatter plots. So at GD in 2018, um, Stephen Kobarov had a, a very good, um, a very good uh, paper presentation where uh, graphs with the same number of vertices, edges, triangles, girth, clustering coefficient, all the same statistics actually looked very, very different. So as we need to look at scatter plots of our actual data to understand what's going on and can't simply look at the table of statistics, the same thing goes for other types of data, including networks. So the moral of this story is we should make calculations, we should do statistics, we should do machine learning, we should do data analytics, but we should also do visualization, and both are equally as important when, when trying to understand our data. So Anscom said that back in 1973, well before all of this uh, data science more recently, never trust summary statistics alone, always visualize your data. Okay, so perhaps there is some value in visualization, but surely the encoding doesn't matter. We can just slap any visualization we would like on top of our data and it'll behave like any other one. Um, actually, no, and I'll give you an example. This was um, a year of his paper presented about five years ago during uh, the same year of his as the first MLVIS. And uh, we studied uh, if the perception of order uh, order as in terms of um, how ordered a sequence is, is affected uh, in terms of uh, encoding. Our motivating example comes from Welsh Rugby and um, essentially uh, our users were trying to understand the flow of a rugby game and in this flow, uh, the order of events happening was very important. Order was defined from uh, left to right, and they were trying to see a secondary uh, thing, whether it was not, whether it was or was not uh, in order. And so the secondary channel could not be positioned with something like uh, hue or shape uh, or all of these sorts of things. And so you had these, these situations where you had a whole bunch of uh, events happening with time ordered left to right. Um, and we wanted to see um, if um, in the second dimension, which was encoded with shape, color, or all of these sorts of things, if it was following the, the same order or not. And so um, this is uh, um, essentially the problem. Um, we have spatial position already taken away and we're looking for a good uh, second channel. So it, we have the intuition that it does matter. So here we have essentially the exact same sequence. Um, encoded with um, value and also size. And just from our intuitive, uh, intuitive uh, way of looking at this data, it, it seems that the size uh, channel is more disordered as opposed uh, to uh, value. And so we were functioning off of this intuition, but as, as of course, you can't just say, trust us, we have to run a experiment to determine uh, if that is actually uh, true. And so um, for the secondary channel, once, uh, once, um, once position had been taken away, we considered um, a total of seven such channels based off Burton's, Burton's uh, retinal variables. These include uh, value, hue, orientation, size, texture, and shape. And we also wanted to uh, test no encoding at all, so numeric, where essentially the numbers were just written down directly. So, uh, uh, complete order sequences. Um, and the data we used was uh, body mass uh, index data. 
And we injected disorder into this sequence by swapping numbers around. And uh, how we quantified the order is we used things uh, such as correlation coefficient. So we randomly swapped uh, elements converging on a correlation coefficient, of a Pearson's correlation coefficient. And uh, given this, we had a measure of correlation and we were able to uh, compare it to what the user entered. Um, uh, essentially what the user saw was um, there was a presentation of a sequence. They looked at the sequence and they entered um, a value of one, to five, where one was completely disordered and five was completely ordered. Uh, and we compared this uh, to our five levels of um, ordering. Uh, response time was also uh, measured to get an idea of uh, the difficulty. So in the end, what uh, finding out is, um, so if we look at um, uh, correctness, it, this correctness measure is, is uh, essentially how, um, how close to the actual order was discovered, uh, how close the actual order the, the entered answer was. So things like size and um, uh, uh, texture actually performed well with value. And um, uh, numeric as well, of course. Uh, but in terms of um, response time, numeric was very, very difficult, whereas size and value were much uh, easier. So it took um, a lot more difficult, it took a lot more time to make a judgment about order um, for numeric. And in the end, um, we discovered that uh, some of these visual channels um, have a tendency to, we have a tendency to overestimate the amount of order in the actual underlying data. Um, and some channels, we tend to underestimate the order in the actual underlying data. So if you look at something like value, uh, you can introduce a lot more noise to that. And people will say it's fairly ordered. They will say it's more ordered than um, what we uh, th than the underlying data suggest. However, for other um, for other visual channels such as Q, um, they will overestimate the disorder. So you can introduce just a little bit of noise to something like Q, uh, and they will say it is very very disordered. So for the exact same data for the exact same data here with a certain amount of, of noise, um, value will appear more ordered and hue will appear more disordered, even though the, the data has not changed. So in conclusion, uh, visualization is important. The same statistics can produce very different graphs. And not only that, the exact, uh, the visualization method that you use is also important. Different encodings of the same data are often perceived uh, differently. So therefore, when we have effective data science, that's the, the point where we understand um, the visual encodings we're using and how they interact with the underlying analytics and machine learning. You cannot consider these two things separately. And with that, I think I'll stop there. And if I can perhaps take a question or two, if there's any on the chat. There's nothing on, nothing on the YouTube uh, streaming. Apart from applause, of course. <laughs> Yako, is there anything on the Discord? Nothing currently in the Discord. There was previously a question um, uh, for um, my part of the tutorial, um, which was about uh, whether deep learning uh, could replace the statistical models that I was talking about. And uh, my reply to that was that, that there was uh, 
there was great potential there, but the ability to replace the models comes hand in hand with their explainability, which is currently an ongoing area of research. Okay. Okay, so if there doesn't seem to be any discussions, we can probably so for our, our first paper session, we have two paper sessions before the break. We might be a little bit late, but for our first paper session, uh, we will start uh, our first presentation by Ilio um, Ventrosilia on progressive multidimensional projections, a process model based on vector quantization. Dan, your audio is not currently uh, coming across. Oh, look, video is. Yeah, Daniel, there's no audio on the YouTube. The, Daniel, there's no audio on the YouTube stream either. Hi, welcome to this presentation on progressive multidimensional projections, a process model based on vector quantization. My name is Elio Ventosilla and I'm here on behalf of Rafael Martins, Fernando Pavlovich and Maria Ribeiro. This is the agenda for my presentation. I'll be talking about the problem that we addressed, the contributions we made, related work, design requirements, which is the first uh, contribution, uh, the process model, which is the second contribution, a prototype of the process model, which is the third contribution, and a discussion and future work. The problem. As data sets grow in terms of dimensionality and size, that is, in terms of the number of features or the number of instances, several uh, challenges arise, one of them being the curse of dimensionality. The more features you have, the more sparse data becomes in the space, which then uh, the, the distance relationships between data points become less meaningful, thus the visualizations of those relationships become less meaningful as well. Uh, lots of work has been done in, in this area. Uh, when data sets grow in, the term, in, in terms of the instances uh, or data points, other challenges rise, mostly in terms of usability, one of them being the time to, to, for vi to visual feedback. So uh, how long would it take a system to provide visual feedback to the user once it starts uh, training on the data set? The other one being visu visual cluttering. So the, the more uh, data points that you have, the higher the chances of these data points to be overlapping in, in their visual encoding. 
and view interactiveness, which in this case we define as those capabilities that a system provides the user uh, in order to interact with the view itself, with the plot uh, interaction, such as brushing or linking. The more data points that you have, the higher the chances that these capabilities will become more limited, especially if you are to account for um, time constraints, uh, such as uh, visual feedback uh, from an interaction. We address these uh, three challenges mainly, and to do so we propose the use of incremental uh, vector quantization techniques as a pre-step to multidimensional projections. Vector quantization techniques in this case compress data into a given number of prototypes or um, representative vectors or centroids and they do it in batches, right? So they do not require tra tra traversing the entire data set before producing some uh, partial result. And they continuously improve as new batches of data come in. Um, in this case, we regard MDPs as uh, dimensionality reduction techniques such as PCA and TSNE, but also clustering techniques uh, such as self-organizing maps, hierarchical clustering, um, as in this case, word or uh, optics, which is a density-based clustering, and, and or the granule gas. We have three contributions. Uh, one is an extension of a list of design requirements uh, tailored to progressive multidimensional projections in this case, and this uh, extension is uh, intended to address the usability constraints that we've outlined. A process model that enables uh, the development of progressive multidimensional projections for large data sets. And um, it, it outlines as well which are those elements, specific elements, which are which enable certain types of user involvement as well as those which are involved in uh, coping with the design requirements. And finally, a prototype of that model showing its validity, validity and flexibility. Related work, when it comes to addressing the challenge of time uh, to visual feedback, we've seen in the literature that some works uh, focus on improving the performance of uh, different techniques or uh, creating techniques which are uh, fast. And another, uh, another way to, to go about the, the problem is through progressive training or progressive analytics, so um, providing uh, partial results to the user within uh, certain time constraints. Then when it comes to visual cluttering, we have that some uh, authors have tackled the, the issue through uh, visual techniques, so using opacity or contours, edge bundling or surfaces, or by compressing the data into a, into a number of representative units, like in the case of these examples that we have here. When it comes to view interactiveness, um, as we've defined it, so interactions with the view that uh, provide visual feedback within the continuity preserve latency, so that is uh, below 0.1 seconds. We haven't seen, to the best of our knowledge, explicit work on it, let alone work taking into account these three challenges together. So the first uh, contribution that we have is the extension to this uh, list by Fekete on uh, progressive analytics. We say that when it comes to progressive multidimensional uh, projections, a system should also provide an overview of the data structure while avoiding visual cluttering to the largest extent. It should also maintain the uh, view interactiveness at a continuity preserve and latency. And it should allow users to navigate uh, across different levels of detail. Since the data is being compressed using a set of representative uh, units, then a user should be able to to look into different regions at a lower uh, level of detail. This is a process model, which is the second contribution. The process model uh, begins with an object, in this case a data set, uh, usually in the form of a matrix. This uh, data set is taken by, by a function S, in this case, which is a sampler. A sampler would produce samples from that data set, and its behavior would be defined by a set, a set of parameters, such as the sample size, replacement, uh, or frequency. And it would have an associated state as well, which in this case could be the number of samples taken so far. A sample produced by the sampler is then taken by a, an optimizer function, which is within uh, the realm of the incremental vector quantization. This optimizer takes uh, samples and then produces uh, 
a, a model, a set of representative units uh, of the data space. Uh, as with the previous function, it also takes a set of parameters defining its behavior. In this case, a uh, number of units is an example, as, as well as the learning rate or the cooling factor. And it also has a state associated with it. In this case, the model also becomes part of the state. So a model at a time t becomes also the, the input to the, to the function for the next modeling of uh, t plus 1. That way we, we ensure having incremental learning, so continuously improving learning on over the distances of the original data space. Other variables within the states are, uh, for example, the execution time that it takes and the goodness of the model. Then the model is taken by another function, u in this case, which is within the realm of the multidimensional projection. u, for example, could be a dimensionality reduction technique like PCA or MDS. U takes this model and then produces uh, an abstraction of the model, right? Which is uh, an object which can later be plotted in some way. As in previous function, it, it also takes a set of parameters defining its behavior, and it also has a state uh, state associated to it. In this case, an abstraction of a previous batch can be used as an input for the next batch, since uh, this would avoid to a large a larger extent. Um, drastic changes in in a projection. This is not necessarily the case for all uh, U functions, but it could be used in certain cases, such as uh, TCNE or NDS, for example. The state can also hold all other variables, like execution time as well as uh, the goodness of the model. And finally, we have this last function, which takes this uh, visual abstraction produced by, by the U, and finally produces a, a view, a plot, which is shown to the user. It also takes uh, several parameters, in this case, uh, plot size or color map are a couple of examples. Users in this case can be involved at the parameters level. A system can show these parameters to the user and a user could also influence the behavior of all the functions through these parameters by controlling them or changing their values. A user can also be involved at the states level where the system shows the states of all the components or the user could also change some of the states, like uh, pausing the execution at some point in time. And finally, a, a user can also be involved at the objects level. Uh, this is less intuitive for certain objects, uh, for example, uh, interacting directly over the data set or, or a sample, for example. We, we mark it here with an asterisk, uh, saying that uh, it is possible, but less intuitive. The most intuitive uh, type of interactions or involvements that a user can have is with the, with the final object, the V, at the very end of the pipeline. Here we give some examples on the different techniques that can be used to fill each one of these boxes or functions. So, for example, in the case of the optimizer for vector quantizing data, we can use uh, neural-based techniques such as self-organizing maps or partition-based techniques, hierarchical-based techniques or density-based techniques. Uh, when it comes to the U function, we can also use DR techniques uh, such as PCA, TCNE, or clustering techniques uh, such as Word or Optics. And finally, for, for the plotting function, we have anything that uh, visually encodes scatter plots or dendrograms or reachability plots. Also, it could uh, be used to, to make visual encoding such as polar coordinates or force graphs or U matrices. In those cases, the U would work as a pre-processing step which does not necessarily is associated to some sort of uh, machine learning technique. For the prototype we made use of these techniques that we have here and for, for the sampler we use uh, Spark's data frame uh, sampling method. This is the prototype. On the left side we have the scatter plot uh, with uh, re visually representing uh, the projection from MDS. On the right uh, top side we have a reachability plot from uh, optics from the optics algorithm and on the lower side then we have uh, the parallel coordinates each one of the yellow toggle buttons uh, can be expanded in order to uh, interact with the with the parameters of each one of these functions um, the visualization here is slightly um, the t the, it's like it's likely fast forward for for the purposes of this presentation. Discussion. When it comes to visual feedback, 
we did manage to achieve uh, visual feedback within the attention preserver, preserving latency, uh, so under 10 seconds. We made trials where we had John, sample sizes of 100. Uh, we had the now? vector quantization no. running for 10 iterations for each one of the batches and uh, 100 no, iterations the for the, maybe the audio uh, multidimensional now on projections in Zoom? for each one of the batches as well. Um, in our trials, we saw that the sampling took 0 0.78 uh, seconds, the optimization took uh, 25 seconds, and NDS and optics respectively took uh, 0 0.02 and 0 0.18. In total, uh, that was 1.25 seconds, which is way lower uh, than the attention preserving latency threshold. And when it came to visual coloring, we we tried uh, plotting all of the points, at least uh, using MDS, uh, but it was not possible. The, the computer kept on crashing due to a lack of memory. But we, we argued that we achieved it, uh, especially for the case of optics. Uh, it would not have been possible to show all of the uh, more than 700,000 data points that we had in the data set. And when it comes to view interactiveness, we knew, we didn't achieve it uh, quite, so it was close to one second. Uh, but this was mainly because of how Python Dash, which is the visualization library that we use, uh, worked. Um, other considerations when it comes to handling the view interactions while training. So the current prototype, if a user was uh, interacting with, the, with one of the plots while training, uh, any updates on the on the plots would have overridden any interactions that the user had been doing at, at that point in time if the interaction wasn't done. One way to handle it is by pausing the, the training while the user is interacting and once the, the interaction is done then uh, continue with the training. When it comes to providing context uh, while zooming in and out, something that we didn't do in this prototype, um, maybe you, you were not able to see it, is that you can zoom in into different regions of the dataset but then we didn't provide context on, on which regions we are looking at once we zoom in. And this is something that can be done using uh, techniques like uh, focus context, for example. And then ensuring time constraints, this comes as a balance between uh, different parameters, for example, the sample sizes and the number of iterations used in the vector quantization and the, and, and the projection stages. If we have very high values for each one of them, is we, we will most probably end up having a, a time to visual feedback much higher than the than the threshold. When it comes to convergence, in this case, there is none, none, none in the prototype, so the system would continue to run until the user decides to stop it. Uh, some sort of threshold or, or yes. criteria could be uh, given for the system to stop. And then when it comes to incremental vector quantization, versus the you said that you took. vantage points in, in dimensional material yes. reduction techniques, we we see the similarity here, and these vantage points could also be used as, as vector quantization, as a pre-step. So the advantage that we see when it comes to other techniques which are not tailored to dimensionality reduction techniques is that it opens uh, the possibility of using other visual techniques such as uh, dendrograms or reachability plots. And the system does add more parameters tuned but we don't see much choices when it comes to visually encoding uh, the structure of a very large data set. For more future work, we uh, intend to extend the model so that it accounts for, for the zooming in and out, uh, so that it also takes into account the user control, uh, the type of user interactions that come on the view and the impact that it might have on other parameters in the pipeline and streaming. And finally, um, we would like to also add uh, certain explanatory techniques such as slime or uh, base rule lists. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Elio. Um, we, um, Elio's uh, video uh, is having some issues, but um, we can take one or two questions from the Discord or the uh, YouTube Live. So are there any questions from Discord or YouTube Live? Ian, Yako? Currently, no 
questions from uh, Discord. How, no, wait, something just came up. So Udo Schlegel asks that how sensitive are the different parts of the process model? So how important are the ones for IVQ for MDP? Um, hi, thanks. Can you hear me? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Uh, yes. Well, I would say they they depend one on the other. So, so yes, parameters in one section would definitely have an impact on the on the rest of the of the pipe. Um, I, I wouldn't have. I, I don't know how much to say about it in in that sense, since we haven't actually tried it out. But uh, if you change the parameters in the IVQ, then that that will change the, dis the distribution of the prototypes, which then will have an impact on the visualization parts, uh, independent on which technique you're applying to. I hope that answers the question to an extent. Okay, thank you. Jaco, um, any... There's a question from YouTube. Oh. Um, awesome. So, which is great. Yes, from someone called Lars Linson. Um, uh, and there's another question to come after that. So, the question from Lars is, did you do anything for temporal coherence in your projections, like avoiding rotations or flipping? Uh, yes. So, that has to do with the second loop in the in the process model. If, if you want to sort of avoid drastic changes in the projection, then you, you should make use of the previous projection somehow as as the initialization of the algorithm itself. Uh, it could happen sometimes, depending on the algorithm, that it suddenly has dra drastic changes. But the, the trials that we did, at least with MDS, you, you end up having smooth transitions from one to another whenever you're making use of the previous uh, transformation, the previous projection for the next one. So that's uh, one way to, to avoid drastic changes. Okay, uh, unless, if Yako doesn't have another question, there's a second one here from YouTube. Oh, a th thanks from Lars, by the way. So thank you, Elio, for that. Uh, De Dennis Kolaris asks, could you elaborate on how explanatory technique, techniques such as LIME can be of help? Yes, so I, I guess that would be a, an interesting topic to look into. The idea is that you could uh, have some manual or automatic clustering on um, on the data that you have. So if it's manual, you have the user selecting data points in the visualization, and then you use those selections as um, labels in the data set. And then you can just run these, these clusters that you have selected through line in order to get some explanations on those uh, those regions that you might have selected. Um, something that might be interesting to look at, or, or at least that I had in mind, is to have this binary selection so that you pick a region in, in, the, in the projection and then you get an explanation for that region as a binary classifier. Yeah. But when it comes to uh, multi-label data sets, and I think that's the way that line works, then um, it should work the same. But I'm, I'm just thinking that Explanations might be slightly more complex, but it's a matter of trying them out and testing them. Yeah. Thank you. That's all the questions I have from the YouTube. Thank you. And thank you very much, Elio. I think in the interest of time, uh, we'll proceed to the next presentation. So the next presentation is by Udo uh, Schlegel, Model Space X, Model Specification Using Explainable Artificial Intelligence Methods. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to Model Specs, Model Specifications Using Explainable Artificial Intelligence Methods. I'm Udo Schlegel, PhD student from the University of Constance. Artificial intelligence solves many previously challenging tasks, like machine translation or autonomous driving. 
In many cases, these challenges get solved by black box models, such as deep neural networks. Imagine we have an input image, such as a roster, we want to classify. We put the image into our black box model. Our model predicts the correct class rooster to the input. However, we don't understand the decision why it was classified as a rooster. Such black box decisions in critical areas, such as autonomous driving or healthcare, need explanations to be undertaken. A car should never crash into another vehicle or human, and an abnormal heartbeat should be detected and taken care of. Explainable artificial intelligence, short XAI, is intended to explain such crucial decisions to humans. Current XAI methods consist of various approaches such as feature visualizations, saliency masks, feature attributions, and decision rules. Feature visualizations show internal representations of neural networks and work best on images as we can interpret the outcome of the technique. In our example on the top, we can identify, for instance in the first image, an animal, most likely a cat, in the next image some structures, in the next image a mix of different structures, textures and shape, and again in the last image an animal, um, most likely a fox. We are able to interpret some of these images based on our interpretation, but imagine such a visualization for time series or text. There wouldn't be many easy to spot features in these visualizations. Further, also saliency masks and feature attributions often need human interpretation to be useful as an explanation. The heat maps of the input image show the attribution or attention of the model in the middle. And again with our knowledge of the label snake and the snake as we can see it in the picture, we can identify the cause of the prediction. However, such an explanation can also be fooled by various tricks and adversarial attacks to show unrelated parts of an image, for example the stones beneath the snake. A more robust way to show internal representations and internal decision makings are decision rule lists, like our example on the right. It shows clearly at which values the classification changes and the cause of the classification even for tabular data. For image data, for example, we can use superpixels to extract similar rules for them. Due to the application of deep learning models in many areas, various problems emerged which XAI has to tackle. Models often get applied without much thought about the correctness of the target and labels of the data. There is often a mismatch between the problem solution and the trained model. For instance, the clever hands problem by learning some proxy to be able to solve the task. In the example, the model should learn in the right image to classify it as a horse or horseman. The model achieves a perfect prediction, however, if we inspect the feature attributions, we see that not the horse or the horseman is the target of the classification, but the description in the bottom. Based on this finding, we identify the model not learning the task, but a proxy to be able to classify the image with horses. We can use this knowledge to clean our training set to improve the model and its robustness. After finding the clever hands problem, the next step could be to align the learned patterns of the model to the domain knowledge of a domain expert. In our example, on the left, the model should classify the image as a train. It serves the prediction with our wanted outcome. The tracks are an important contextual information, as we know from our domain knowledge, for the classification and should be necessary for correct prediction of the model. Again, the feature attributions of the model shows such a heat map and attention to the tracks. Thus, we can verify our domain knowledge of the tracks as contextual information for the model as it learns the tracks as pattern for the classification. However, these are only examples using images. If we work with other data types, such an easy interpretation is not possible for non-intelligible data such as time series or tabular data. We propose model specs, a workflow for model specification based on XAI methods. 
At first, the workflow begins with the user task with the problem formulation. Afterward, the KDD process or Visual Analytics workflow is extended by XAI methods on top of data, model and output and the user extracts semi-automatically rules using rule extraction methods based on XAI techniques. Then the user iteratively refines the rule sets to generate a model specification. Such a model specification enables to evaluate and verify trained models by comparing them to the formulated problem. Our workflow starts with a problem formulation a user does. The user writes down its intention to solve a task, not specifying how. The problem that is now formulated describes the first step to a goal. A proper formulation is essential as a faulty formulation or incorrect formulation leads to a wrong model. Notably, such faulty formulations can often be seen if a domain expert downloads a pre-trained model and just applies it on its task and target without much thinking about what is its goal and problem. Next, our workflow uses the KDD process and Visual Analytics principles as a baseline. XCI methods are applied on top of these steps to extend the process underneath model training and steering. Especially these XCI methods get used on the data, the model, the output, as well as the metric. To extract as much information about the components, the XCI methods extract as many rules as possible from these. During training, rules are extracted over the different levels and gaps as much information as the model itself learns. Next, all the extracted rules build a collection for analysts to gain knowledge about the model. Through adjusting the extracted decision rules, analysts can inspect and steer the various extracted rules. In such a case, adjusting can be compromised by changing parts of the decision rules based on domain knowledge. For instance, the comparison value of a decision rule can be decreased based on knowledge if the threshold is not correct, either too low or too high. The black box model is then off by this value, but our model specification has a more exact representation of the problem to compare, for example, the next version of the model to. Further, as there are many overlapping rules, analysts can iteratively and interactively prune rules they see as less relevant for the model specification. This process helps to narrow down essential rules for the expert to solve the task. It also reveals overlapping rules or rules which are forgotten during the training or afterward. Through such an example, overfitting can be identified as the rules get more concrete and less general over time. The resulting model specification is a machine-readable description and describes how the model solves a particular problem, behaves for particular inputs, and can be used to compare generated knowledge with the initial formulated problem. The collaboration between model and human leads in this case to a comprehensive model specification as the extracted rules are based on the model and the adjusted as well as pruned remaining rules cover the human's intuitions. However, to remove bias, which an analyst can introduce, the previous process can be repeated to generate various model specific specifications that can be compared and refined. Such a repetition also helps to improve the comparison of the generated knowledge extracted from the model and the initial problem formulation. In our use case example, we present an analyst who wants to use machine learning and especially neural networks for his prediction task. The task the expert wants to tackle is a predictive maintenance task. Based on sensor data, a prediction should be made if an engine will fail soon and if there is a need for maintenance. For the problem formulation, the analyst has two questions. Is the anomaly detection robust enough for real-world deployment? And does the model match some of the domain knowledge gathered by analyzing the data. Next, the expert employs our workflow onto the training of the model. An RNN, in our case an LSTM, is applied to the time series to predict if there is an anomaly or not. 
As a metric, the F1 score is chosen to show the quality of the prediction on an imbalanced data robustly. RxRen, a rule extraction method, is applied to the data, the model and the output during training to extract as much information and as much decision rules as possible. Afterward, the analyst inspects the extracted decision rules and analyzes the overlapping rules as he identified overfitting while training. To the expert surprise, a decision rule shows the main knowledge the analyst identified to be essential for an anomaly. The analyst prunes the available rules to a small subset of the extensive decision rule list and generates a model specification with, for example, the discovered rule and the robustness to the task. At last, the expert identifies a robust score of 0.95 of the F1 score on a real-world deployment dataset as an answer to the first problem question. And, as mentioned before, the analyst identifies the domain knowledge based on extracted rule to answer the second question. We identify three research opportunities regarding our workflow. At first, more real-world applications based on the workflow need to evaluate the suitability of our workflow and the mentioned methods. We plan to tackle predictive maintenance, trajectory forecasting, animal behavior modeling and crime forecasting using the proposed workflow. However, due to the general applicability of the methods, other fields and tasks are possible and we encourage usage on different topics. Next, we want to tackle the interactive decision rule list visualizations, one of the most critical parts of the workflow. There is a need for tailored visualizations in this part on broad visual decision rule lists for our task of adjusting and pruning. Especially if the domain, data and task changes, individual visualizations are needed to support experts to work with the decision rule lists. At last, we want to mention the need for rule extraction methods with human in the loop approaches. As the extraction of, rule, of rules is time consuming and complicated, incorporating human domain knowledge steers possible rule extractions. For instance, in direction for a guided debugging of critical decisions. For example, inspecting critical decision borders between adversarial examples and real images leads to more robust models. We encourage research into such models. To summarize our approach and give a small take-home message, we propose model specs, a conceptual workflow to interactively generate model specifications for complex machine learning black box models to be able to evaluate models on their suitability for a task refine problem formulations to steer solutions, to generate as well as extract knowledge about specific application domains and to interactively align the user task with the model. Thank you for your attention. If you have further question, feel free to email me. And thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Udo. I'm wondering if there's any questions either on the Discord or on uh, YouTube comments. Yako Ian? At this moment, there are no questions in the Discord. And uh, none quite yet on YouTube, I don't think. I'm just keeping an eye on it. Well, I could I could ask a question. Sure. So, um, in the founding of visual analytics, there's a, a standard pipeline, and there are some some similarities to to what you proposed in your framework and the original paper that founded visual analytics. Can you give me some ideas to what the principal differences between the two are? I'm pretty sure there are, but to underline it might be helpful. 
Um, so what we thought that we somewhat, so in most cases, like there was this question before with Lime, um, we have not only our ML model, so for example, um, a deep neural network, um, but also a model like Lime, so an explainer um, or a surrogate model. And um, based on this, we have like another dimension, which is not currently in the, um, yeah, in the visual analytics um, pipeline or um, workflow. And so we thought that this is one thing that uh, needed to be extended. And then based on this, um, there are also like outputs of this, um, of this explainer, so to say. And um, these outputs have to be tackled. And in our case, we want to um, really focus on decision rules and um, that we can decision rules extract out of the data, the model. And um, for example, if the model was switched out of um, every model that was um, applied, what the data was applied on. And um, based on these, we then want to incorporate the human again and um, yeah, get the um, yeah, the decision um, rules he really likes to see or he really knows um, that should be um, contained in the data to um, go to get to his model specification so that he really has like, um, yeah, so to say a good formulation of what, uh, what he wanted to solve. So the problem in the end with his own model specifications or with his own words, so to say, based on um, an ML model. Excellent. Thank you. Do we have uh, any any uh, questions from either of the channels? Not, not from YouTube, no. There is no question from uh, Discord. Um, Elio Delicilla asks that uh, should there be a metric for uh, accuracy versus explainability at the end of the pipeline that the user should take into account? Um, good question, but um, explainability is really dependent on the person, I would say, and on the human um, which is incorporated in the process. So I don't know if there is a good metric to um, yeah, really uh, yeah, grasp the idea of what, uh, um, what a human really um, wanted to see and what the uh, accuracy, for example, showed of the model. So, for example, if you have um, animal, de animal detection and you only have the accuracy, then for sure the F1 score would be better. Um, but this doesn't matter if the, yeah, if the human just wanted to see if the model really grasps some of the ideas of how an animal looks. So if he can identify one animal and not like the 10 which are in the data against the uh, 1,000 or 1 million normal looking, um, yeah, normal stuff. <laughs> I hope that answered your question. <laughs> so in the end, an ex uh, a metric for explainability would be very nice, but I don't know if that's possible. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, a little bit in the interest of time, because we, we ran uh, a little bit over. Um, uh, we'll probably close the session there. So MLViz will return um, at half past. And so um, I, the YouTube stream is going to change. So please go look at uh, the schedule and click on the next YouTube live stream. Uh, thank you very much, and hopefully I will see you after the break. Thank you. Just going to say it's very good to use the word half past because, of course, we're all in different time zones, but it will be half past in whatever, whatever hour it is you are.